Hey, good morning, everyone. I thought while we were down here working on the new blueprint for Architect, I was going to do daily readings. No different than we used to do in a live jump, which we still do, of course. And of course, you can get the jump VOD. I thought we'd do morning readings where we're going to have discussions and we can start your day off, not just jump starting your day, but jump starting your mind, jump starting your heart, and ultimately, with the blueprint to healing, starting to understand how we create. So, from an undis undisclosed location, uh, let's start today. Today is going to be lesson number one, which is called Reality, Lies, and Objectivity. Now, I'm going to be reading part of this from a great teacher that has taken the journey almost two centuries ago. What's interesting about two centuries ago is that the obviously the information is still relevant, which means that deep down inside in places we don't really want to talk about, we're all connected and we're all the same. The question is, is how are you applying it in today's world versus where he was applying it? But in and of itself, it's basic. It'll give you food for thought. It'll start to bring up uh, emotions, maybe belief structures, passions, hurts, wounds, things that we're suppressing, compressing, and oppressing and tend to do more often than not so that we can truly look at who we are versus who we think we are and the first couple of steps to the blueprint blueprint to healing. So here we go. Uh, realities, reality lies in objectivity. So this is an interview between we call the questioner and Maharaji. And Maharaji was, again, a great teacher from all the way back in the 1800s. And a, uh, an experience that I found that has been profound on me and my personal journey, I think you'll enjoy it as well. So let's give it a go. Reality lies in objectivity. Your world is illusory as long as it is subjective and to the extent that only reality lies in objectivity. Questioner. I'm a painter and I earn by painting pictures. Does this have any value from the spiritual point of view? Maharaji, when you paint, what do you think about? When I paint, there's only the painting and myself. What are you doing there? I paint. No, you don't. You see the painting going on. You are watching only. All else happens. The picture is painting itself, or is there some deeper me or some God who's painting? Consciousness itself is the greatest painter. The entire world is a picture. Who painted the picture of the world? The painter is in the picture. The picture is in the mind of the painter, and the painter is in the picture, which is in the mind of the painter, who is in the picture. It's not, is not this infinite state of, uh, infinite, is this not infinity of states and dimensions absurd? The moment we talk of the picture of the mind, which itself is in the picture, we come to an endless succession of witnesses. The higher witness, witnessing the lower. It is like standing between two mirrors and wondering, <laughs> wondering at the crowd. Quite right. You are alone and the double mirror is there. Between the two, your forms and names are numberless. How do you look at the world? I see the painter painting a picture. The picture I would call the world. The painter I call God. I am neither. I do not create, nor am I created. I contain all and nothing contains me. When I see a tree, a face, or a sunset, or the picture, and the picture is perfect. When I close my eyes, the image in my mind is faint and hazy. If my mind, if it's my mind that projects the picture, why do I need to open my eyes to see a lovely flower when, with my eyes closed, I can only see it vaguely? It is because your outer eyes are better than your inner eyes. Your mind is turned outward. You learn to watch your mental world, you will find that it even more colorful and more perfect than the body can provide. Of course, you'll need some training. But why argue? You imagine the picture must come from the painter who actually painted it. All the time, you look for the origins and causes. Causality is only in the mind. Memory gives the illusion of continuity and repeti repetition as well. I'll we'll try that again. Repetitiveness creates the idea of causality. When things repeatedly happen together, you tend to see casual links between them. It creates a mental habit, but a habit is not a necessity. You have just said the world is made by God. Remember that language is an instrument of the mind. It is made by the mind for the mind. Once you admit a cause, then God is the ultimate cause and the world is the effect. They are different, but not separate. People talk of seeing God. When you see the world, you see God. There is no seeing God apart from the world. Beyond the world, to see God is to be, is to be God. The light by which you see the world, which is God, is the tiny spark I am. Apparently so small, yet the first and the last, last in every act of knowing and loving. Must I see the world to see God? How else? No world, no God. What remains? You remain as a pure being. 
And what becomes of the world and God? Pure being. It is, is it the same as the great expanse? You may call it so. Words do not matter, for they do not reach it. They turn back in utter negation. How can I see the world as God? What does it mean to see the world as God? It's like entering a dark room. You see nothing. You may touch, but you do not see. No colors, no outlines. The window opens and the room is flooded with light. Colors and shapes become into being, and the window is the giver of the light, but is not the source of the light. It is the sun that is the source. Similarly, matter is like a dark room, consciousness and the window, flooding matter with sensations and perceptions, and the supreme is the sun, the source of both matter and light. The window may be closed or open, but the sun shines all the time. It makes the difference to the room, but none to the sun. Yet all is secondary to the tiny little thing, which is I am. Without the I am, there is nothing. All knowledge about the I am. False ideas about the I am lead to bondage. Right knowledge leads to freedom and happiness. Is I am and there is the same. I am denotes the inner, there is denotes the outer. Both are based on a sense of being. Is it the same experience of existence? To exist means to be something, a thing, a feeling, a thought, an idea. All existence is particular. Only being is universal in the sense that every being is compatible with every other being. Existences clash being never. Existence means becoming, changing, birth and death and birth again, while in being there is silent peace. If I create the world, why have I made it bad? Good question, by the way. Everyone lives in his own world. Not all worlds are created equally good or bad. What determines the difference? the mind that projects the world colors in its own way. When you meet a man, he is a stranger. When you marry him, he becomes your own self. When you quarrel, he becomes your enemy. It is your mind's attitude that determines what he is to you. I see that my world is subjective. Does it also make it illusory? It is illusory as long as it is subjective, only to, the ex only to that extent only. Reality lies in objectivity. What does objectivity mean? You said the world is subjective and now you talk of objectivity. Is not everything subjective? Everything is subjective, but the real is objective. In what sense? It does not depend on memories and expectations, desires and fears, likes and dislikes. All is seen as it is. Is that what you call the fourth state? Call it what you like. It is solid, steady, changeless, beginningless, beginningless, and endless, ever new, ever fresh. How is it reached? Desirelessness and fearlessness will take you there. End of reading. So what Maharaji is inviting us to do is the same thing we talk about in a couple days in, in, in the jump. And the jump is talking about the infinite or the I, infinite, becoming finite. What he's really saying is that our world is perceived subjectivity, how, subjectivity, well, subjectively. Let's try that again. It's perceived, perceived subject. That word and I are just not getting along today, so we'll just go with it. Fine. Subjectively. There we go. So we see the world, right? We experience it, and that makes it subjective. But objectively, if you step back, this is called the witnesser and the witness, or the, the, the viewer and the, and the viewed, or the observer and the observed. When you look at that from an objective point of view, it is what it is, it always has been, and always shall be. We are placing our own internal perceptions on it, which then begets the questions, where do those perceptions come from? And if you've been around architect or the jump long enough, you know we place that on what's called the four pillars, right? Those four pillars are mother, father, religion, and state, which are formed generally in the zero to seven years of age called the imprint stage. And that's how our subconscious mind, which is what runs this entire thing we call a spacesuit or body, has programs. It runs on cycles and habits. We talk about this in day two in the jump, where if we realize that our body is based on cycles and habits, it therefore means those cycles and habits apply to our emotions, it applies to our spiritual view, it applies to our behaviors, it drives our sex, it behaves, it behaves to our business. Everything starts to apply in behaviors and patterns. It therefore stands to reason, it also applies to how we see ourselves and how we see the world. And there's an old saying we say in architect that says, um, fix you, fix it. What that means is, 
nothing's really broken, but if you want to fix it or adjust it, you have to adjust the viewing lens by which you're seeing the world, which means you have to unwind your mind to get down to the core value of what you're really interested in and what you're seeking to really create. And then understanding that everything you're viewing externally, it was what Maharaji is talking about here, is just a perceptional value of how the light comes into the dark room of your mind and creates the perceptions of colors, shapes, sizes, and ultimately judgment value, like, dislike, etc., etc. Those are all the perceptional values. And ultimately when you go through AITs, Architects in Training, or you're going through Architect Mastery, you start to break that down from the clinical perspective. How do we create a perception? How do we create a value of that perception? What is the meta driver that drives that? Commonly called an emotional sequence, right? Then how do I view that in time? Is that something I'm currently projecting into current time state or am I pulling it from my past and then bring it into the future? Or is it a future projection not yet realized created from my imagination, seeking to create an experience, either A, wanting to be repeated, or B, to be avoided. Either way, I'm not currently present, which means I'm creating from a past sequence or a future that doesn't really exist. Which then gets us back to the question, what's the point of creating a lifestyle if you miss your entire life? Now, most people are going, what are you talking about, Travis? I'm not missing my life. A minute every day I get up, I have my coffee, I go to work, I, I feed the kids, blah, 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 blah. I'm not missing my life. Okay. But isn't that said from a person who is creating from a habit, from an experience that says this is comfortable? What happens when you're put in an uncomfortable state? What if you change your environment? What if you change a relationship? What if you change jobs radically and suddenly and only because you put yourself in an uncomfortable space? That's where we find out where our belief structures really lie. And that's what Maharaji is inviting us to look at to go, even in the uncomfortability, that's still a perception because the world is being perceived subjectivity, where we're actually putting our value system on what that actually is, as opposed to just saying it's another part of the, the, the journey or the chapter, because it is what it is. And it's a really deep thing to wake up in your morning cup of coffee, but here's the response. Wouldn't it be interesting if you woke up every day and had something to help drive that day where you can measure that value and say, okay, this is what I'm looking at for today. I'm looking at this value system to say, how do I perceive the world? And then watch how you perceive the world from the perspective of just the habit, starting with today, perceiving the world without judgment. Now, that's going to be a difficult one. I know I'm an ass kicker when it comes to judging. I'm really good at kicking my own ass. I suspect you probably are as well. And so over the years, I have learned that I can watch my judger of myself and ask, why am I judging myself against which standard am I judging myself? How do I see it in my head? How does it feel? What's the voice in my head that says that's good or bad? as opposed to just looking at the experience and going, I created that in some form or another. Now, I don't mean creation as in created like God created, meaning you created by an energetic sequence for that experience to come into your world, the I in finite creating externally into the finite so it can be reflected back. Because we're so subjectively, so, so subjective in our own mind, we're so lost hypnotically in our own head that sometimes we need to see it outside ourselves as an external experience in order to see the reflection back in. No different than looking in a mirror. When you look at a mirror, you do see the many faces of yourself. And if you actually take a video of yourself, which I'm actually doing on a current project, over a 30-day period, you can watch all the different faces of yourself. Now, those different faces are projections of personality parts that has how you view the world subjectively and where the judger is coming in, where the perceiver is coming in, the victim, the martyr, the, the blamer, uh, all of these different personality parts that we put on in order to perceive a world based on a value structure, how the light coming into the dark room of our mind, if you will, is illuminating all the parts of, that we've created. Now, when I say recreate, we're only creating here. See, a lot of times when people say, oh, I'm gonna manifest it in the world, I'm the creator, what they're not really understanding is everything's already created. That's the illusion. That's where we get caught up in a religious pillar that says, well, I really can't say that because then I'm saying that I'm God. Well, the response is you already are, at least in nothing else, a part of God. Otherwise, you wouldn't exist. That's what Maharaji is inviting us all to look at. It's not that you're seeking to truly create. It's what you're doing is pulling your, the veil back of yourself, letting more light come in and saying, okay, this is the, the part that I want to align with. And through that alignment, quote unquote, the creation comes into a finite existence because it's already there. We're just choosing to allow ourselves or give ourselves permission to finally objectively see it without subjectively judging ourselves for wanting it, wanting to experience it, wanting to have it, wanting to let go of it, whatever the experience is. So instead of coming from the perspective of I'm the creator, how about just coming from I am? Now, whatever comes after the I am is what's truly you're going to create. So what I mean by create, again, it doesn't mean that you're presto chango, it's coming out of the air and you're the creator of boom, there's a planet. 
What I mean is you're creating a pathway or a connection point from the inside to the outside because the outside already exists. All that ever is going to be created was already created. And our little bit of a lifetime here on vacation planet Earth, we'll call it 100 years if you're lucky, everything that you're going to experience has already been created, already been done, already been done a billion times before and will continue to be a billion times after. How you choose to experience that current creation, well, that's where it is subjective. That's where you get to determine what is it being judged by, who's doing the judging. More importantly, are you willing to give yourself permission? Are you willing to love yourself enough to start seeing the world objectively and saying, this is what I want to align with the creation shows up when you're ready to be the person that you're ready to experience externally. So for example, if you want to experience more money, you start aligning yourself with the, uh, the ideology that you already are money. Now for a lot of us, that's a hard one to do. I know when I was younger, when I was, you know, Dr. Fox and I knew everything, in my 20s, I had a lot of money, made a lot of money, but I always felt like I was needing more money. I felt vulnerable, I felt like I had to get more, I never felt safe, which had nothing to do with money. But because subjectively I would put that layer on top of how I viewed money and how I viewed making money, I was in a constant state of need, constant state of desperation, constant state of requirement, constant need of never feeling safe, secure, which then projected itself onto my entire world around, onto to my ex-wife, onto my kids who were younger at the time, onto my business dealings, onto everything I do, onto my own physical body, but start feeling that vibration, that creation because I was creating it from here by how I aligned myself. So part of the objective subjective experience that we'll start with today is about how are you aligning yourself with what you're feeling down here? Now I know that's for a lot of you that are gonna be like, damn Travis, I thought we were just having a cup of coffee. Well, we are, but more importantly, every moment that goes by, every second that ticks, every minute that clicks off, every day that you experience is one less day that you get back on your vacation planet Earth. Isn't it time you start looking at it from that point of view? Architect out. Talk to you tomorrow. Bye-bye.